<laughs> but here, here's Jonathan. Thank you. Are we all set with the camera as well? Yeah. All right, I think we're good. So let's get going. I know it's the last talk of the day. I'm going to try to keep you guys awake. So this talk was titled Scaling PHP to 40 Million Uniques. That's actually a lie. So when I created this talk, it was correct. Unfortunately, that's no longer true. It's now 60 million uniques that Etsy serves per month. So it's going to be a little bit more interesting, hopefully. All right, so who am I? We already got this. This is all recap. I work at Etsy. I organize the Boston WebPerf Meetup Group. I was at Wayfair, and I led a team to convert stuff to PHP. Pretty simple. If you want to see all the slides and links from the presentation, they're available right now at the short URL. Don't skip too far ahead, because there's some surprises. But you can check that out right now and not have to take pictures of the slides or anything like that. The, the links are all there right now. I'm going to reference Code is Craft throughout the talk. It's a blog that Etsy runs. It's all written by engineers at Etsy. Just good to know about. I'm going to talk about it a lot, so just so you're aware. That's just our Etsy engineering blog. Before we get into this, some quick stats about Etsy. We get around 1.5 billion page views per month. We did about a billion dollars in sales last year. We have over a million lines of PHP. And as I mentioned, we get about 60 million uniquely, unique monthly visitors. This is a graph of traffic in 2012. And the 2013 traffic is following a similar pattern. So this is us here in August. And you can see up here, this is, this is about 50% higher. So I know I've pulled the y-axis off this graph, but in absolute terms, the peak of our holiday season is 50% higher than our traffic in August. So what this means is that this holiday season, it's not going to be 60 million uniques. It's going to be 90 million uniques. And it's not going to be 1.5 billion page views. It's going to be 2.25 billion page views or so. That's a lot of cats in Santa costumes. <laughs> Something we think about all the time is not just cats, but scaling for our users, scaling for our sellers and buyers as the holiday season approaches, which it is right now. One of the interesting things about Etsy is that our architecture is pretty simple. This may look kind of complicated, but it's just because there's a lot of lines connecting different boxes. It's actually your standard three-tier web application. So you've got a request coming in at the top, load balancer, and you've got some web servers, memcache, boxes, and MySQL. You can see the numbers on the right there. You've got less than 100 web servers, tens of memcache boxes, tens of MySQL shards. And those are in master-master pairs. We have a few others as well, so that doesn't cover the entire stack. We also have some search boxes running on Solar. We have Gearman. We'll talk more about that in a bit. We do have some Redis as well. And we have Postgres. It's a legacy database we're trying to get rid of at the, point, at the, at the moment. So let's start off by talking about the web tier. This is the thing that probably most people in this room care about. So we're running Apache and PHP, probably the most relevant. We're going to spend the most time talking about this part of the stack. First of all, the hardware we use is mostly super micro. Each box has two eight-core Intel processors in it. 24 gigs of RAM per machine, and uh, a 160 gig SSD. So some of you might be thinking, why do you put an SSD in a web server? Web servers don't tend to be I.O. bound. They usually just put all the code in RAM. Anybody have any guesses for why we might have solid state drives in our web servers? Yeah. OK, so the, the answer was when we're swapping. That's actually not the main reason. Anybody else have a reason? Yeah? So serving statically cached files. Those are served on different boxes, actually, so it's not those. Yeah. Reliability? No, not reliability. One more try. PHP includes, <laughs> PHP includes require IO. No, so those are actually all going to be cached in opcodes. So I'll, I'll, uh, one more. Heat. Heat. There we go. All right, heat and power. So we pay for power in our data center, and we pay for cooling in the, in the data center. SSDs consume less heat, and they generate less, or consume less power and generate less heat. So actually, over the life of a drive, a small SSD isn't that much more expensive than a spinning drive, but you save money on, on both heat, uh, well, cooling, and, uh, and on power as well. And then on top of that, we do things like logging to the drives before the logs get shipped off to a central server, so it helps logging as well. But the primary reason is to save costs in the data center. All right, on these boxes, we're running Apache. Just 2-2. Two, two. We're sort of like chilling, stable, works well. Using PreFork as our, as our process manager. And the main reason for this is because PreFork's the best at sort of isolating requests from each other. We want to make sure if one request is having issues, it doesn't influence the rest of the processes. It just kind of does its thing. 
and then goes along its way, and the other requests are fine. We just use mod PHP, nothing too fancy. And then here are the sort of critical numbers for our Apache setup. I don't want to focus too much on these numbers. The most important one to call out is this max request per child set to zero. This means that the, ch the Apache children don't die automatically. They live essentially forever, but we do restart Apache on all the web servers every night as part of our load, uh, as part of our log shipping process. And uh, so we roll all the servers at night. So the maximum time an Apache child is going to live would be 24 hours between the, the log rotate. So what about PHP? This is a PHP conference. We're running PHP 5.4. As I mentioned, we're using Zend Opcache. Anybody know what this is or heard of it? Maybe five or 10 people? Who's heard of APC? All right, that's like most of the room. So Zend Opcache was recently open sourced by Zend. It's essentially a replacement for APC. But whereas APC has a user cache and an opcode cache, Zend has no user cache. There's no key value store in it. It's just an opcode cache. So basically what that means is it takes the PHP code in its compiled form as opcodes and then puts it in memory. So that's why we have that three gigabyte memory segment. The reason for this is we have different translations, so our templates have different, trans different languages in them. We have to cache all of this in memory. We don't want to hit disk to get any code. So all the memory is cached in, in memory, in Zen.cache. For each process, we set a memory limit of 128 megs and a max execution time of 30 seconds. So let's talk about optimizing PHP. Who was here for my talk last year called High Performance PHP? About a dozen or so. So a quick recap of that. There's a link to the presentation at the bottom of the slide and also at jkle.in slash nephp. But a quick recap is use an opcode cache, which we just talked about. Use things like xhprof or xdebug to profile your code. Use statsd and graphite to monitor it. Find your hotspots and then finally upgrade PHP. I don't want to rehash all that stuff today. We're going to talk about some new things, some new optimizations for PHP. If you want to hear about this stuff, come find me at the party or go look at last year's talk. So some new things that we've done at Etsy recently that have been big wins for us are, for one, creating static arrays. So this sounds kind of crazy, right? Like, what do you mean? Well, here's an example. All of our translations, Etsy's now served in, I believe, it's nine different languages. All of our translations go into static PHP files. So there's a hash, associative array, there's a hash, there's some content, the actual translated string, in this case it's German, and then essentially a location of where that, that string is going to be replaced. So we have these tons of translated files that are automatically generated from a database. These files get deployed with the site every time we deploy the site. It's a separate deploy process. We don't want to deploy and generate the translation files every single deploy. So it has to be a manual step to click, yes, I want translations deployed. But the benefit of this is these translation files get put into the opcache memory segment, and they're extremely fast. PHP is extremely good at accessing PHP arrays in memory. It's way faster than mcache, way faster than an APC key value store, maybe on par, and then obviously way faster than going to a database. So this is the most performant, scalable way we've found to handle high-frequency data in our stack. And it's not just translations. We do this for all sorts of data. If we have a piece, maybe it's a small array, maybe it's only 100 elements or 200 elements of data that only changes a few times a day, that's something we'll put into a static array and then deploy with the site. Because we're deploying the site 30 to 50 times a day, it's not a problem to make a deployment to make a static content, a static array change. So this is the kind of thing where previously you might have put it in memcache, but by having these, these really heavily accessed values in memcache, you use up a ton of bandwidth in your data center, and you just use up memory in memcache you don't need to use. So this has been a big win for us. Another thing we use a lot is Gearman. Who's heard of Gearman? Maybe 15, 20 people? So Gearman's a job server. At a very basic high-level view, essentially what we do is anything that is going to take a long time, we farm that out to Gearman and then return the, the process back to PHP as fast as possible. So we want to make these things asynchronous. This might be things like resizing images. It might be batch processing some listing data for a seller. But these things get shipped off to Gearman. Gearman turns away. We have a whole separate pool of servers for this work. And then PHP can return as quickly as possible. People can get back to doing what's important, like buying Santa costumes for their dogs. As I mentioned, we deploy pretty often. One thing we rolled out recently was this atomic deploy strategy. Now, atomic deploy simply means at the moment of deployment, you switch from one version of the code base to a new version of the code base in a single instant. So there's no mixed files. You don't get file A from the previous code deploy plus file B from the latest code deploy and get mismatch in files that way. If you do have mismatches at a high-frequency site like ours, you're going to wind up calling functions that don't exist yet. 
things like that, really bad. So you want to have your deploys be as atomic as possible. And the way we do this is with a few different techniques. So we wrote a new Apache module called modrealdoc. Modrealdoc has a pretty simple role. It basically just gives, very, very early in the Apache process, it gives you the absolute path to the code on your server. So this allows us to know exactly where the code is executing from, and that's going to come in handy in a minute. We also wrote a PHP extension in-house called InkPath. These are both on GitHub, by the way. And this essentially lets you establish at a higher level in the extension what the include path is for all of your PHP includes. So this means if you change the base path of the code, like you do in modrealdoc, you're going to then include the right, the right files for the rest of the request. So with these things together, we are allowed to do, or we're able to do, an AB symlink swap. So what this means is on the server itself, we have a directory, think like slash var slash dub 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 slash a, and then slash var slash dub dub slash b. Those are two directories, and we simply swap a symlink back and forth between the two sides. So I've talked a lot about deployment. You might think, what, is this, what does this have to do with scalability or performance? Well, this is where it comes into play. When you do the symlink swap, the thing that it buys you is you can avoid re recompiling files to opcodes across two deploys. So if you deploy to side A, then you deploy to side B and a couple files change, then you deploy back to side A and put the symlink back, any files that have not changed over the course of those two deploys don't need to be recompiled. So this avoids the problem of saying we're deploying the site 50 times a day and we're blowing away our opcode cache 50 times a day, which is what some sites have to do. Maybe they deploy and restart PHP, and then you purge that whole memory segment. This allows us to keep most of the files in memory, cached in opcode cache, throughout the entirety of our site being up. And we have that, like I said, we restart Apache every night, so we're going to blow that cache away in the middle of the night. But during the heaviest traffic parts of the day, we're going to keep those op code, that opcode cache hot. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Yeah? So what, what percentage of your site is US and the rest? So the question was, what percentage of the site is US versus other countries? It's still a little more than half US, but we have a lot of traffic in other countries as well. I think we're, like I said, I think it's about nine languages right now, and I think we're in more than nine countries, just many. It's like probably a couple dozen countries in total. Yeah. Any other questions about the symlink swap deployment strategy? All right. So I mentioned upgrading PHP. <coughs> we recently went from 5.3 to 5.4, and there's a pretty big, big plus for us. So here's a graph of CPU between 5.3 and 5.4. This is about a 40% drop in CPU, according to Ganglia and Apache, on, on web servers. So the top two lines there, the green and the yellow, those are two servers running 5.3, and in the bottom, the red and the blue, they're running 5.4. So this was pretty consistent. You can see that the CPU isn't spiky. It's actually quite flat, quite stable. So this really was a 40% drop across the board, across our entire web farm. Similarly, on the memory side, 5.4 is much better at memory usage. So we saw about a 20% drop in memory usage just from switching to 5.4. And then finally, the thing that maybe most people care about, performance, this is a graph of our top five pages performance over time. So that dip you see in the middle, that was our 5.4 upgrade. So you can see we shaved about 100 to 200 milliseconds off of every single page request at the 95th percentile. So again, this was a, this was a pretty huge win. And it, I don't want to make it sound like it was very little work, because we did have to spend some time upgrading and making sure things were compatible and testing it across the board. But for a software upgrade, that's a nice performance improvement. My team, my performance team, didn't have to do any work to make that happen. So if you're not already on 5.4, I strongly recommend getting on that path. So once you've got this PHP application, you know, you've got to think about, let's try to understand framework overhead. A lot of people here love frameworks. A lot of people use them. But there is a cost associated with using a PHP framework. This is a benchmark of various PHP frameworks that are pretty popular. The top, you can see these requests per second, so higher is better. At the top, you can see Falcon. This is a framework that's written mostly in C. And then you, know, you see it towards the bottom, we've got Symfony 2 and Zen 2. The difference in requests per second just between these PHP frameworks is huge. We're talking about over 800, and then maybe you look at some of the more realistic frameworks that aren't in C, so 2 to 400, down to 30 requests per second. So this is a big difference. Let's look at a different benchmark. This is a benchmark done by Tech and Power. So here's raw PHP. This is a benchmark that encompassed many different frameworks, not just PHP frameworks. And this isn't the bottom of the list. This is just about the middle of the list. There's only so much I could fit on a single screen. You can see most of the things at the top, or maybe you can't see, but the things at the top are most things like Go or C or Java frameworks. These are compiled languages where PHP is not going to try to compete with these compiled languages in performance. 
PHP is doing pretty respectably. It's right in the middle there around Scala, Node.js, things like that. It's doing pretty well. That's raw PHP again. If we scroll down, we'll see now we, we find some more popular PHP frameworks. So there's Falcon, and then you can see Code Igniter and Symphony. Let me just blow this up. It's a little bit more clear. So at the top here, again, these numbers on the left side, those are, you can think of them as operations per second. So higher is better. Raw PHP 2800, doing pretty well, middle of the pack. Falcon, the fastest PHP framework, is about a quarter of that, 800. Yeah? And then Code Igniter is down to 500, and then Symphony 2 is actually at the bottom of the list for every single framework on this benchmark at 151. And the numbers themselves aren't important. What's important to recognize is that the, number, the difference in numbers from 2800 down to 151. I want to be clear here. I'm not saying don't use frameworks. Frameworks can be very, very useful. They can speed up developer time. And there are certainly use cases where you don't care as much about performance, you care more about productivity. And that's a very valid reason to use a framework. But it is true that frameworks are going to be harder to scale than if you're rolling your own. And this is almost true by definition, because frameworks are, are general use cases, right? They're trying to solve the problems of many people. Whereas if you write your own PHP application, you're only solving your problems. And you can get rid of the cruft and not have the overhead that most frameworks have. So my point here is simply to try to encourage you to make this decision consciously to use a framework, understanding the trade-offs, understanding that you're getting productivity and trading performance and scalability instead of making it unconsciously and just waking up a year down the line and, and realizing that it's very, very hard and expensive for you to scale your application. You have to buy more servers to handle the, the overhead of the framework you're using. And it also might play into your decision of which framework to use based on the performance of those frameworks. Question? Yeah, so the question was, do we have a customized framework of our own? Yeah, so everything in, at Etsy is built in-house. We have our own custom-built ORM, our own framework that we've built, built for ourselves. And we can tweak it, obviously, as much as we want, and it's, it's very specific to the stuff that we do. So it was a lot more work to write, but at the end of the day, it, it performs a lot better than something out of the box would. How does it spit on that chart? It's <laughs> a good question. We have to contact Tech, tech and Power. No, we haven't, we haven't benchmarked it along the, with those other things, because those are benchmarks done by third-party organizations. And, we don't have the same setup. We'd have to duplicate their whole methodology and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I, I can't give you a great answer to that, unfortunately. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So let's move on down the stack. Let's talk about Memcache briefly. So Memcache servers are running roughly the same hardware as our web servers are. This is mainly to keep the configuration options for our stack just pretty simple. About the same hardware, more memory, obviously, because Memcache, you want to keep everything in memory, not go to disk at all, kind of defeats the entire purpose. So each server, each memcache server, has about 48 gigs of memory. And like I said, we have about, well, tens of memcache servers. So over the course of our entire memcache pool, we have hundreds of gigabytes of memory in play that we can store data in. We also shard the keys across the servers. So no two memcache servers are going to have the same data. We use consistent hashing to, to spread the keys across the different servers. So you have 10 times the servers, you have 10 times the storage capacity for data. And because memcache is inherently not a persistent storage mechanism. If they go down, that's fine. You can recover from that. You can get the data from the database. So we don't have any redundancy. You just have data spread across the however many servers are in the pool. And then if one fails, that's fine. You just bring up a new one. And then you just fetch the data from the database in the meantime. I talked a little bit earlier about the issue of having things that are hit super often and things that are memcached that are just really hot keys. So we actually built a tool in-house to, to deal with this. It's called MCTOP. It behaves a lot like the Unix tool you're probably familiar with called Top. It's on GitHub. Basically, what you do is you run this tool. It sniffs all the network traffic between a web server and memcache box. And then it gives you a list of keys in order of, you can sort by different things, but in order of bandwidth used, size of the key, et cetera. You can pick what column to sort by. So this was something last year that was really biting us. We had this problem where we had a few hot keys in memcache that were consuming a ton of bandwidth, consuming a ton of CPU and memory on the memcache boxes. And we wanted to find out what they were and try to pull them off memcache. We used M MC top, we identified maybe five or 10 keys that were super, super hot, moved those into static PHP arrays, and then dramatically reduced memory usage and bandwidth usage in our data center. This is the kind of thing where by finding the, the really big offenders, it's sort of like the 80-20 rule, right? So 20% of the keys are providing 80% of the bandwidth. So you find these big offenders, you move them out of memcache, move them to a local machine, you get dramatic speed ups across your entire application. This is a tool that we found extremely useful to help us diagnose problems with memcache. And then at the end of the day, memcache is just a simple key value store. We don't use any super complex things in memcache. It just kind of does its job and, and goes along. 
So let's keep on moving down, down to MySQL. This is a sharded infrastructure, so <coughs> we're, we're running 5.5. Uh, that's something that happened pretty recently, and <laughs> if you look at that link, that's where all the links are for the presentation. But there's a pretty interesting story about how we accidentally upgraded from MySQL 5.1 to 5.5. Uh, and took the site down for a few hours. Which just actually happened while I was interviewing at Etsy. This is a pretty exciting time to be getting an introduction to postmortems and all that. But the, these are in master-master pairs. So they're sharded across a certain number of tens of servers. And each, each set of servers is in a master-master pair. What this means is that we read and write to both sides of the pair. So we have an A side and a B side for each pair of MySQL servers. There's a few benefits to this. The first is that you can scale out reads and writes. So because we have master-master, you write to both sides, we have bi-directional replication, it means that you can scale things pretty easily because you just add another server, make the server bigger, and, and you can get those, the sort of double the, the capacity you would have if you did not have the master-master pairs. The other big benefit is it allows us to very easily make schema changes. Because these master-master pairs have the same data on them, you can take one down, change the schema, bring it back up, take the other one down, change the schema on that one, and then bring that one back up as well. So this is a, a way that we can make live online schema changes without taking the site down, without upsetting customers, and with doing this all, keeping our site scalable and redundant. We use EnoDB for our storage mechanism. Uh, we have a thread cache of 800, and our mass connections are set to 2,500. One of the, the key pieces of our, our MySQL infrastructure is that we have almost no joins. So even though this is a relational database, we're trying to use it as much as we can like a key value store. So almost every lookup we do is a primary key lookup. This is because it scales really well. We do most of the join logic in the application in PHP, and then we try to make as many calls as we possibly can, just simply primary key lookups. As a result, our MySQL boxes are not, they're not CPU bound. Uh, there's almost no work being done by the CPU on the box itself. It's just fetching uh, data from an index. When you put all this together, we can serve about 9,000 requests per second, dynamic requests per second. These are just PHP dynamic requests. It's pretty good. It's not an invitation to DDoS us. I don't want you guys to test this, and maybe if you do, you know, you make this guy even sadder than he already looks. He won't get his hat for Christmas. But it's, it's a lot of traffic, um, and, and that's something that we, we keep a pretty close eye on. And we, do, we don't do load testing, so this number back here doesn't actually come from load testing numbers. This comes from capacity planning. So we, we can look at what a single server can handle and basically multiply that out across our infrastructure. Because everything's managed by a chef, everything's the same hardware, so we know that it's going to scale out horizontally pretty well. All right, so what about static content? Somebody asked a question earlier about images and CSS and JavaScript and, and how do you handle that kind of thing. We have a lot of images on the site. This is a search results page, standard search results page. This is just one size of image you're seeing here, but each listing has many sizes. I think we do something like 15 sizes per listing based on different parts of the site where it's going to appear. When you add all this up, we have about 500 million images. It's our working set at Etsy. It's pretty hard to store these. It's pretty hard to serve them fast. We have a few strategies for making sure this doesn't take down our site all the time or to be able to handle this kind of traffic. The first strategy is to offload as much as we possibly can. We don't want to be serving all these requests at origin. So we use multiple CDNs to solve this problem. Everybody know what a CDN is? Maybe half the room? OK, so CDNs are content delivery networks or content distribution networks. Basically what they do is they have edge servers all around the world where they cache your static content on those edge servers. And then a given user will try to get the content from the closest edge server to them. So there's a few benefits. The, the main benefit for us, probably, is simple bandwidth offload. The CDNs are serving this content for us. The users don't have to come back to our origin. Don't, we don't have to use our, bandwidth, our data center. Uh, and it just saves us a lot of hardware and, and money in that regard. But the second benefit is obviously to have your content close to your end users. If somebody in California is, yeah? So we have a few different CDNs. Uh, I don't know how public the different ones we have are. I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty well known that we use, we've used Akamai for a while. And we have a couple other CDNs as well. But anyway, so I was saying that the, the other benefit of CDNs is having the content close to your end users. Because the speed of light is not as fast as you might like it to be, <laughs> if somebody in Australia is requesting an image and they have to come back to New York or Boston, wherever your data center happens to be, to get that image, it's going to take them quite a long time. So we have our CDNs have edge servers in country. So they have an edge server, an edge node in Australia. 
and the customer can get that image off of the edge node in Australia and save that round trip all the way back to New York. So you might think, with 500 million images and three CDNs, how do you possibly get a good hit rate? Well, we've tweaked this quite a bit, and we've managed to get our image hit, hit rate above 90%. So this means that 90% of the image requests that are made for images on Etsy.com are coming from one of our CDNs. And this is across all three CDNs we're getting an above 90% hit rate. In fact, one of our CDNs is more like 99%. It's extremely well cached. They have almost an entire 500 million image working set in their, in their cache. And that's somewhat of a, I don't know, a lie. Because again, this is the kind of thing where you have a long tail, right? The popular images, things that are on the home page, the most access listings, those account for the vast majority of traffic. And there's a long, long tail of images that aren't hit as often. So those long tail images don't compose a huge amount of traffic. They don't really need to be in cache. You can cache maybe the top 100 million images and you catch over 95% of the traffic. CSS and JavaScript are also cached by the CDN. And that hit rate is close to 100%. Because CSS and JavaScript only changes on deployment, we make a new file name every time you deploy CSS or JavaScript, that stuff gets cached extremely quickly at the CDN. And then since we're deploying 30 or even 50 times a day, that's only 50 changes given the day. And then every other request is going to be cached at the CDN. So basically 100% hit rate for CSS and JS. When you put it all together, our three CDNs in aggregate serve about 7,000 requests per second at the edge. And then anything that falls through is going to come to our origin. So this is, again, 7,000 static requests, and that's on top of the 9,000 dynamic requests that we can serve at peak. What about misses? So what happens if we don't have the image cache in the CDN? What happens if somebody has to come back to origin and get it? We have a separate image serving infrastructure for that whole process. And it's pretty simple. Again, come through our F5 load balancer. We have image cache boxes, again, tens of these. They're running Apache traffic server, ATS. And then behind that, they're running Apache and PHP. The reason for that is you have ATS, which actually caches the images themselves in memory. So it's something that sort of avoids the thundering herd problem, where a bunch of people come try to get an uncached image at the same time. That stuff's cached in ATS memory. It can be served out very, very quickly. If something's not in the ATS image cache, it then goes to this Apache PHP process, which goes to our two data stores for images specifically. We have images on S3, Amazon's storage system. And we have images on the NetApp SAN that's in our data center. So basically, the source of all images is the SAN. Once the images are cut up into the size we want, those images go onto S3. And then that's kind of the place where they live going forward. So when you talk about trying to get an image from Etsy, I'll grab you in a second. When you talk about getting an Im image from Etsy, the first stop is CDN, second stop is ATS, third stop is S3, fourth stop is the SAN. Do you have a question? So the question was, why don't we go from the CDN straight to S3? Because S3 is slow, uh, is the main reason. So S3 is inconsistent and not as fast as you might like. So we want to have that ATS, extremely fast ATS caching layer ahead of S3. And then the ATS layer and the Apache PHP stuff behind it can also make a decision about, OK, the image isn't on S3. Let's get it from the SAN and do the logic there. So that's the main reason. All right, so what about change management? We make a lot of changes at Etsy. We're sort of known for deploying things rapidly. How do we handle that stuff and make all these changes quickly without compromising our scalability or compromising our performance of the site? One of the main ways you do this is through feature flags. This is something we've open sourced as well. It's the feature project on our GitHub page. And it's, it's pretty simple. We use static PHP arrays for this. It's our favorite way to handle these kinds of problems. And you can see there's a few different options for how to use this API. If you have this server config array, you can have multiple keys. So this in case we've got a key foo and a key bar. This particular key is enabled for specific users. So you set an array of users you want to enable this feature for. In the second config stanza, you can see there there's a different config name, Vaz. And then this is an example of how we do A-B tests. So we set an enabled parameter, and then you have different variants enabled at different levels. So in this case, we have two variants off and then one variant at 50%. And then the final option here, I mean, there's more than just this, but these are three examples. The final example on the page, this is where the, the config flag is actually fully on, enabled to 100, 100%. But there's also some data associated with that config key. So this is a way we can store little bits of data as well that need to go along with a feature. 
The API for accessing this in the code is also extremely simple. It's literally if feature is enabled. And then you can see the foo.var, that's to chain keys. So if you have a nested key like we had here in the top example, you just do foo.var and you get that key. And the feature class itself will do the logic to determine who are you, is it enabled for you, do the randomization algorithm to tell you if it should be on, if it's only on a few percent, et cetera. It's a very simple API, and yes, we do have these if statements sprinkled around our entire code base to turn things on and off. <coughs> so you might be wondering, again, how does this relate to performance? Well, a typical situation here is you might write a new feature, and then you slowly ramp it up. So maybe you ramp it up 1% first, then 5%, 25, 100. What this means is that it enables you to see, at 1%, are we affecting performance at all? At 5%, are we affecting performance? Are users changing their behavior? We run A-B tests, sometimes at 5 or 10% for weeks at a time, to see how user behavior changes, and to see if any of the graphs that we have move. So this is a very safe way to turn on a new feature without taking your site down by having it be bad for performance. So as long as you use the functionality that we have in this feature API, and ramp things up at a slow, steady rate, you can make sure you're not going to overwhelm your web farm by building something that's extremely inefficient. So this is, this is a key part of how we keep things stable and deploy rapidly without breaking everything. The tool we use to make all these deployments happen is called Deploynator. Again, this is something that's open sourced. It's on GitHub. It looks like this. There's basically just two buttons. The first one says, save the princess with tests. <laughs> this tool's evolved over time. It used to say push to QA, but now we're saving the princess. Basically what happens when you push this button, the code gets packaged up, the JavaScript gets minified, everything like that, and it gets shipped off to our QA environment, which we call princess. While that's happening, we have a suite of automated testing that's running. The code gets to our princess environment. We coordinate all of this stuff through IRC. You may be able to see at the top of the slide, it says push topic. There's a channel called push, and the, ch the channel title indicates who is in the push queue. So it tells you, we can do a whole talk on deployment, but it basically tells you who's up, who's pushing code right now. So the code's on QA, our princess environment. You're testing the code there. No customers are actually hitting that QA environment. It's just manual testing from the engineers. And at the same time, these automated tests are running. Once you see the code on the QA environment and you think it looks good, in channel, you, there's a robot. You tell the robot, looks good to me. You wait for the automated testing to complete. Once the testing is done and passes, then you click the big deploy to production button. That's really it. The deployment process is just two buttons. Deploy to princess, and then deploy to, deploy to production. And then again, once it hits production, you do some more testing, you watch graphs, then you tell the robot that everything looks good, and then your deploy is done. So that's, the, that's the entire push process that happens at Etsy. Everyone who comes to Etsy pushes on their first day, and most days from there on. We try to release these things in, in small batches as much as possible. I mentioned earlier about schema changes. To make these schema changes, we have a tool called Schemanator. Now, Schemanator looks almost identical to Deploynator. And this is essentially how we make schema changes. Because we have this master-master pair, AB side model, it's pretty easy for us to make schema changes. And this is all it takes. You push to GitHub, press the big deploy production button, and the schema change happens. So this whole process of it allowing us to make rapid changes to production is, is extremely valuable for scalability because we can make things safely, make changes safely, and then also fix things quickly. So if something goes wrong, if we do cause a scalability problem, it's very easy to roll back. We don't have these two-week release cycles. We don't have to wait for the next release to fix a bug. These things can happen many times a day. Do you have a question? Yeah, so the question was how many A-B tests are we running at any given time? Uh, I mean, on the order of hundreds, potentially, um, yeah, I mean, certainly dozens, but there's, there's a lot running concurrently. And we have a, an in-house built tool to analyze that data. I believe that's open source as well. Yeah, so the question was, when we're making schema changes, what happens if you try to like make in backwards incompatible changes, right? So you can't really do that in SC. You have to make every schema change has to be backwards compatible or else our whole sort of model falls apart. And sometimes that might mean making a new table with a new data type and switching over to it, that kind of thing. And we do run alters, but they can take an extremely long time to run if we're like altering the data type of a call. And that does work. I mean, you can run an alter, um, but it's, it's going to take a long time with traffic on the server. We don't typically copy data from an old table to a new table. That might happen in an extreme case. Most of the time you can make the changes you need to uh, with the table being live, but some changes will take a very long time because they're under load. 
the question was how to make a change. Well, basically with Schemenator, I mean, anything that's new, most of the changes we're making is simply like adding a column. That, that's going to be fast, right? Unless there's a default value, that's a pretty fast operation. So that kind of stuff can happen easily. Uh, or even adding a new table that's not being hit, that's also super fast, right? So most of the things you're doing from a schema point of view are extremely fast and aren't, aren't hard to do. Where you get into problems are when you're altering existing columns, that sort of thing. Yeah? Yeah, the question was when we're pushing code, how does how do we know how does it know like what to deploy? Yeah. For the schema? Yeah, how Sure, yeah. So I, I think it's just SQL files. Yeah, I'm not not super familiar with it, but I think it's just SQL files that are being pushed. All right, so let's move on. We're running a little short on time. So that's our existing infrastructure. What about recent improvements we made? What what things have we changed recently that have made a big difference for us? So this big drop here happened last year, and this was actually upgrading to Sandy Bridge. So all of our web servers were previously running the older version of an Intel processor architecture, and we changed everything wholesale to Sandy Bridge. We upgraded every single web server on our farm, rolled all of our hardware, and we got a big boost in performance just by doing that. And this wasn't a cheap operation, but our servers were pretty old. It was time for a refresh anyway, and just by simply changing the architecture, we got a big, big benefit. So this is the kind of example where vertically scaling your application can work pretty well. And one of the big things that we, we like about this is not only are requests served faster, we also have more capacity. So you can see how previously, before this change, it was a little more periodic in terms of load time. And then after the change, it stays a little flatter. So as traffic goes up, things stay pretty flat. Spot us capacity while at the same time reducing load time across the entire stack. This is a graph of our baseline page. This is a page I made last year. Basically what it does is it just has our standard header and site header and site footer on it and then it uses our standard controller architecture. So this is like the minimum page you could ever write at Etsy to serve a web request. We use this as a, as a baseline to sort of determine what's the lower limit on load time for our entire site. And as you can see, over the past, this is about the last 10 months, we've had a number of pretty big stair steps down. The first one here was a very small code change. Remember that feature API I talked about? Somebody found that we were using strtoke in the middle of the function, and they changed that from strtoke to some sort of, another, I forget exactly what it was, but it was another like iter tools type thing. And we dropped load time off the entire site by about 20 ms. That's because we run f up to 500 or 1,000, even 2,000 feature checks on any given page. So these are things that are happening in extremely tight loops at times. And if you're executing a piece of code 800 times on a page and you make a very small code change, it can have a huge impact on performance. The second change here, this was 5.4. We already talked about how there's a big, big benefit. So that's that other big step down. And the final change here was actually disabling hyperthreading. Who knows what hyperthreading is? All right, maybe like 10 people. So at a really high level, hyperthreading is essentially having a processor, a, one, a single processor, act like two processors. This can be valuable <coughs> because if you have your processor that's waiting on a lot of network requests, maybe it's waiting on memcache or waiting on MySQL, it can do other work and pretend it's a second processor. But in our application, we're actually on the web servers anyway, we're CPU bound. And it was actually just thrashing. So it wasn't helpful for us to have hyperthreading on. That act of behaving like two processors when it was really one was, was actually hurting our application. So we did a bunch of testing. We actually found this kind of by accident when we were doing capacity testing and planning for, for the holiday season. Found this by accident, realized that hyperthreading was actually hurting us, turned it off across the entire farm, and got a nice little drop, drop in load time. Not a huge benefit, because you, I mean, it's not a huge amount of milliseconds. The, the y-axis is probably hard to read, but it's maybe 5 to 8 ms. But this bought us some capacity and bought us some performance across the entire stack. It's a good change to make. All right, it's not all roses and puppies. What happened yeah. on Memorial Day? What happened on Memorial Day? Spike. That spike's probably a site outage. Those do happen from time to time. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's probably just a site outage. Once in a while, we push bad code. Things break. Um, OK. <laughs> so what are, what are some challenges? that we've run into. Well, right now, our web tier is working out well, memcache is working out well. The big challenge right now is the database. And this is the case for almost all applications, right? The database is typically the bottleneck. Our MySQL shards, like I said, they're not CPU bound, but they are I.O. bound. So the two resources that we really need on the database side are IOPS, I.O. operations, and disk space. And the problem with disk space on the MySQL box is that if you have a spinning drive, let's say a 15K RPM spinning drive, if you make that drive bigger, you're going to make your seek time slower. It's actually harder to find stuff on the disk. If the physical platter is spinning in the drive, it takes longer to find, find data. 
So when you start running out of disk space, you have a few options. You can buy more servers by scaling horizontally. You can scale vertically, like buying SSDs. Or you can do something to change your architecture and try to alter the way that you're making queries. The problem with buying more servers is that when you buy more servers, right now, we make queries in series across our stack. So if you have to talk to five shards for data, or 10 shards for data, it's going to query each shard in series. We don't do that in parallel currently. There's a project underway to look into parallel querying, but at the moment, you query shard one, shard two, shard three, shard four, et cetera. So when you buy more shards, it actually does hurt performance for those specific use cases. Now, ideally, for most things, they're primary, primary key lookups. You're hitting a single shard. But for some aggregate queries, you do have to talk to multiple shards. So buying more servers costs, costs something there. Then scaling vertically costs money. Changing the architecture is hard. So what do we, what do, we do about this? Well, we basically just do everything, right? Let's just upgrade all, all the things. Um, the, the, we are going to be buying more shards soon. We're probably going to be upgrading some hardware. And then we're going to make some architecture changes. This is an ongoing conversation we're having right now. The current thinking on it is we're going to separate our logical and physical shards. So you think about this, it sounds complicated, but basically the idea is you have a set of logical shards, so the different data is partitioned across different shards, and you have physical machines where that data resides. So you try to abstract away the logical shards, how many different shards or pieces of data are there going to be, and then you abstract that away from the physical machines. If you can make this abstraction very clean, then you get the benefit of being able to scale them independently. So you can scale your logical shards based on your data and scale your physical shards based on your capacity needs. So once you can separate that out, it allows you to, to scale your whole entire application a little bit more effectively. It is complex when you get into the nitty gritty details, primarily because you have to handle server failures. What do you do in that case? How do you migrate data from shard to shard? And how do you maintain data consistency during migrations and during failures? So there are certainly a lot of issues that we have to overcome to make that approach work. But it's something that kind of has to happen if we want to continue to scale the application and not dramatically change things from where they are today. How big is the database in terms of like terabytes of data? Uh, I, don't, I don't actually know. I don't have the number for that, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So the, the question was, uh, we do a lot of primary key lookups. Why don't we use NoSQL? I sh I'm actually going to mention that in a second, but we did use MongoDB for a while. We actually moved off it because we wanted to be back on MySQL because it's more well-known, it's more stable, it's a proven technology, et cetera. So for us, the main thing is keeping, having something that's stable, well-known, and having few technologies in the stack. So we do try to, you know, the trade-off between using the right tool for the job and not having a million tools. So we've decided to kind of standardize on having MySQL for everything. And MySQL is pretty fast for primary key lookups. It's just a question of the actual hardware and architecture behind it. So I don't think NoSQL would help us too much, and it'd be a huge, huge change from an architecture point of view. So for monitoring, we do use Graphite extremely heavily. Uh, Graphite with StatsD. So StatsD is a tool, again, we wrote in-house. It's open source. And it allows you to write things that can give you stack timers. This is an example of our search page. These aren't labeled right now, but basically what we do is we have timers wrapped around each section of the page. So this might be fetching search results from solar. It might be processing those search results into HTML, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when you break things up like this, any time a, a given page load time spikes, you can drill into the, into the stack timers and see exactly which part of the page got slower. So this can help you narrow down problems very, very quickly. From a systems point of view, you use ganglia pretty heavily. Graphs look like this, just simply monitoring CPU usage, memory, and all that kind of stuff across the different web clusters, and et cetera. And then for alerting, we use Nagios. It's kind of an older tool. A lot of people like to hit on it, but it does work. And it keeps everyone pretty happy and letting them pamper their whiskers. So that, that's what's working for us right now. All right, some quick takeaways in the last few minutes. This is what it comes down to when we're talking about different NoSQL options. Keep it stupid simple. We try to keep things clean, easy, straightforward, well-maintained, well-supported, well-understood. And that allows us to, to do things we might not otherwise be able to do. We don't have to spend a lot of time ramping people up on our stack. It's PHP, Apache, MySQL. Most people know that kind of stuff. In a similar vein, we want to use proven technologies. As I mentioned, you know, we actually moved off MongoDB. There's a good blog post. If you search for MongoDB at Etsy on Google, you'll find that. There's a good blog post about why we stopped using it and, and decided to go back to things that we know and understand. It can be sexy to use HTML9 responsive boilerstrap.js, but you know what, at the end of the day, uh, it's not going to help you out too much. 
this is, the, this is the way the web's going, right? There's a JS framework for everything. You can stable them together and get all sorts of amazing functionality. But when you're trying to build an application that scales to billions of page views and millions of sellers and buyers, it helps you to, to keep things <laughs> a little bit more stable, not use the bleeding edge all the time. And then you, know, you want to understand your stack. We, we do a lot of work at really deep levels in the stacks. We've made a lot of contributions to PHP core. We run a fork of MySQL. We've patched Gearman a number of times. We really try to deeply understand what's going on under the hood and be able to make those changes when necessary. Measure everything. Etsy's, again, known for kind of putting a graph on it. If it moves and it connects to the internet, put a graph on it, whether that's a coffee pot or a server. Uh, and that enables us to, to be able to drill down and find, find problems pretty quickly whenever they occur, because there's going to be a graph for it. And then finally, work at Etsy. We, we love remotes. I'm remote. I work from Boston. Etsy's based in Brooklyn. We have remotes all over the world, and we're, we're always hiring, looking for good people. So that's it. Make sure you come connect. We, I run a meetup group here in Boston. There's a careers page. You can find me via email or on Twitter. And thanks for coming. I think we're pretty much at time, but if you have questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah. So the question was, because we're using primary key lookups, what slowdowns do we see on PHP when joining large data sets? That's a great point, and it actually can become a big problem. I, I'm on the performance team, so I work on the slowest pages of the site, so I see a lot of these issues. And good examples of that, we have a Teams page, right? So this is one of the things that pops up a lot. And what the Teams page does is it says, like, here are the teams you're a part of, and for each team, there's like a user avatar, and then for a lot of the teams, it'll show you the, the most recent conversations about that team. So you're fetching all these different conversations. And then each conversation has an avatar for the person who started the conversation and one for the latest poster. So fetching all those conversations, all those avatars, they're on all different shards. So pretty soon you're talking to every single shard in our infrastructure, and you're fetching all these things in a loop. And that gets very, very slow. So it is a problem. We're basically trading performance for scalability. Because you can scale these things horizontally, it's OK. You may have individual pages that slow down because you're doing the joins on the, on, the ser on the web server side, but it allows you to scale your application. So it's a trade-off we've decided to make, and yeah, it can be a problem. And that's why we're looking into these parallel querying options. Wait. Did you run into problems, the problems of memory in the PHP processes? Um, not super often. Occasionally we'll see add memory errors. I actually fixed an issue a couple weeks ago with where we were like umming on, on a, a seller page. Like basically we had this problem where for a given seller, if you looked at your canceled orders, we were fetching every single canceled order and trying to display them all on the page at the same time. And that was out of memory for sellers with a ton of canceled orders. So that does, does happen at times, but we've tried to eliminate those cases and use pagination and that kind of thing to try to avoid pulling back giant data sets. Yeah, why do you pick opcache over APC? So uh, Rasmus, who wrote PHP, works at Etsy. He didn't want to maintain APC anymore, so we're using opcache. <laughs> No, that's, that's a, a simplistic answer. Opcache is marginally faster, and there's a team at Zen working on it. Uh, and, and yeah, like Rasmus didn't want to work on APC anymore. He figured somebody else could maintain it, and, and that's kind of the, the way forward. So opcache, Zen opcache is bundled with PHP 5.5. It's the future of the way the language is going, so we want it to be on, be on that. Sorry, follow-up question? Go for it. Do we use FPM at all? Do we use FPM? No, we don't. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's 5.5 on the radar. We upgraded the 5.4 uh, earlier this year, so we haven't thought a whole lot about 5.5. Think about 5.5, so there's a huge performance boost from 5.3 to 5.4. The performance boost from 5.4 to 5.5 is pretty minimal, um, almost non-existent. And the features that arrived in 5.5 aren't things we desperately need at the moment. So there's not a huge motivation for us to upgrade at the time, at the, like right now. I, of course we will. I don't know when it's going to happen. It might, it, I'm almost certainly not going to be this year because the holidays are approaching but probably early next year we'll think about upgrading to 5.5. It's just not going to be a huge, huge win for us right now. I do have a book. I forgot to give it away. Somebody got the heat comment, right, about SSDs. Who was that? There we go. All right, you win the book. <laughs> Any other questions before we wrap this up and go to the party? Yeah.
So yeah, the question was about row databases versus column databases because our application is well suited for that kind of, it's similar to the NoSQL question, right? So why don't we use NoSQL? Why do we use MySQL? It, it, again, it's just because it's just we like MySQL. It's, it's proven, it's been through the ringer a bunch of times. We understand it extremely well. Um, yeah, that's, that's the main reason. And, it, and it's, it's a good enough tool for the job. It might not be the best tool for our specific use case, but it's the best tool for our operational knowledge and understanding. Yeah, so MySQL versus Maria, which we've always been, we've probably been using MySQL before Maria, since before Maria existed, since before MySQL was owned by Oracle, that kind of stuff. So it's just been around for a long, long time. And we could switch, but it's like, why, you know? We're running a fork, we... Yeah, I mean, again, it, it's not so much the engine that's the bottleneck for us right now, it's more the, the storage mechanism itself. All right, well, I'll be around tomorrow. Uh, thanks for coming again. <laughs>